Hi, and welcome to another edition of Your Health with Dr. Christie. My name is Dr. Christie Reisinger, and today will be the third and final segment of my series based on the book by Dr. Matthew Walker called Why We Sleep. If you haven't watched the other two parts, I encourage you to do so. But today we will talk about why we Americans struggle with sleep, and then we'll end the segment with treatments for insomnia. Let's start with the question, why can't we sleep? Some of it can be attributed to longer commute times and having to get up earlier in the morning and sleep procrastination due to electricity and on-demand television and entertainment. But in his book, Walker discusses five other factors that include, number one, constant electric light, including LED light. Number two, temperature issues. Number three, caffeine use. Number four, alcohol use. Number five, alarm clocks. Let's go through each of them more in detail and the action steps that you can take. Number one, we know that we have constant exposure to electric light. Natural sleep would normally occur between eight and 10 o'clock p.m. because it's dark outside, but artificial light tricks us into thinking it's daytime. Light causes a delay in the release of melatonin. And blue LED light is the worst and suppresses melatonin twice as much as incandescent light. There was a study that had two groups. The first group had five nights of reading a book on paper. And the other group had five nights of reading with an iPad. And the results were that reading on an iPad decreased melatonin release by 50% at night and the people that read on iPads took longer to fall asleep and had reduced quantity and quality of their sleep. They lost REM sleep and they felt less rested and sleepier throughout the day. And interestingly enough, this effect on melatonin release lingered for several days even after no longer using the iPad. Well, what are some action steps? Some recommendations in his book were to lower light in the evening hours, and to avoid overhead lights. We should use blue LED light blocking glasses, maintain complete darkness throughout the night, and we can install software on our devices that gradually desaturates harmful blue LED light as evening progresses. Number two, the next issue that causes problems with sleep is sleep temperature. To go to sleep, you must lower your core temperature by two to three degrees Fahrenheit. You will always find it easier to sleep in a room that's too cold than too hot. And a bedroom temperature of 65 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal for sleep for most people. That's really cold. So something a little bit easier would, could be to lower your bedroom temperature by three to five degrees from what you usually do if you're struggling to sleep. Also consider taking a hot bath or shower prior to bed. It's been shown to help promote 10 to 15% more deep non-REM sleep in healthy adults by dilating your blood vessels and helping to dissipate the heat from your core. Number three, the next item that affects our sleep is caffeine. Caffeine tricks your brain into feeling alert despite high levels of the pro-sleep chemical called adenosine. Caffeine mutes our response to adenosine, and the degradation of caffeine varies between people based on genetics. But as we age, the longer it takes for our liver to clear it. What's the action item here? It's probably obvious, but avoid caffeine, especially late in the day. It can take up to eight hours to wear off. Next up, alcohol. I know many use alcohol to relax before bedtime but alcohol fragments sleep, and it litters sleep with brief awakenings that you're not aware of. It also suppresses REM sleep, which in turn deprives you of dream sleep. So the action item here, of course, is to avoid alcohol, especially heavy alcohol use at bedtime. And lastly, what about hitting that snooze button as a way to extend sleep in the morning? The alarm artificially awakens us suddenly from sleep and causes a rise in blood pressure and heart rate with an explosive burst of activity that initiates from the fight or flight nervous system. We're the only animals that artificially awaken ourselves in the morning. This may be one of the reasons why the most common time of the day for heart attacks is in the morning. 
So an action item for this would be to try to have a schedule that allows you to awaken naturally. But if you do use an alarm, don't hit the snooze button. You are repeating this process of rapid rise of heart rate and blood pressure, and it's not good for your heart health. Next, let's shift gears and talk about sleeping pills. What about using them to help get a full night of sleep? Well, everyone knows some of the obvious side effects of sleeping pills, and they include next day grogginess, daytime forgetfulness, slowed reaction times during the day, and dependence. There's also something known as rebound insomnia, which is worsening insomnia, at least for a time, when these drugs are stopped due to your brain's dependence on them. Did you also know that sleeping pills increase the risk of death? I know, this was shocking to me. Which pills specifically are linked to increased risk of death? Studies have mainly been focused on Zolpidem or Ambien, Azopiclone or Lunesta, Temazepam or Restoril, and Zalepline, known as Sonata. A large cohort study in the British Medical Journal compared 10,000 people that took sleeping pills versus 23,000 that did not. The study showed that individuals using prescription sleep medications are significantly more likely to die and to develop cancer than those who did not, even when other factors were controlled that could contribute to mortality, such as smoking and BMI. And even very occasional users, less than 18 pills a year, were still 3.6 times more likely to die over the two and a half year assessment period. Plus, these sleeping pills don't even work. Another large study evaluated numerous studies involving the sleeping pills called the Z drugs. These are Azopiclone, Zalepline, and Zolpidem. After analyzing the studies, they concluded that sleeping pills helped patients feel like they fell asleep 25 minutes faster. But those that took placebo felt like they fell asleep 19 minutes faster. That's only a seven minute difference. And as Walker concludes in his book, quote, there was no objective benefit of these sleeping pills beyond that which a placebo offered. I just don't think the benefits of these sleeping pills outweigh the risks. However, there are alternative medications for treating insomnia in the US, and they include diphenhydramine or Benadryl, Romelteon or Rosarem, Doxepin, known as Selenor, and Suvorexant, known as Belsomnora, Trazodone, and Melatonin. The advantage of these alternative drugs is that their risk-benefit ratios are less clearly known to be unfavorable, but there has not been a lot of data studying them. So if you must take something for your insomnia, consider talking to your doctor about these medications. But what should patients really try first? It's something known as cognitive behavioral therapy with a therapist that specializes in insomnia. And therapy may include instituting some of these obvious behaviors, such as establishing a regular bedtime and wake time, and don't deviate on the weekends. This seems to be the most effective. If you can only do one behavioral change, do this one. Dr. Walker has an even more comprehensive list in his book. Well, why should cognitive behavioral therapy be used first? Studies have shown the benefits of CBT for insomnia. It helps patients fall asleep faster at night. Patients spend less time awake during the night. And this benefit persists long-term, even after no longer working with a sleep therapist. The American College of Physicians has made a recommendation to try CBT first, not sleeping pills. And a five-week online program can cost as little as $50. And finally, let's end by talking a little bit more about melatonin. The use of melatonin can be a helpful way to treat insomnia, but it must be used with the correct expectations. Melatonin may be most helpful for seniors because as we age, we simply produce less melatonin. One study showed that adults ages 55 and older that took melatonin had a shorter time to sleep and improved sleep quality and morning alertness but melatonin has not been shown to have the same beneficial effects in younger and middle-aged adults, except when used in jet lag. Why? 
Melatonin acts as an indicator to our bodies that it's dark and to prepare ourselves to sleep. So it regulates the timing of sleep, but it doesn't generate sleep. But melatonin can have a powerful placebo effect on sleep, which is legitimate and should not be underestimated. So if any of my patients want to try melatonin, I'm not opposed. I tell them to just be sure to get it from a reputable supplier because it's not regulated by the FDA and therefore the quality can vary widely. This concludes my series on sleep. I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Matthew Walker for writing his book and providing such good data on the importance of sleep. Thanks again for joining me.